All right. Well, welcome uh, everyone to the first of our uh, Remembrance Week um, uh, events. Uh, as you all know, this is part of the Holocaust Genocide and Contemporary Bioethics Program, um, which takes place uh, normally uh, in person on all four of the campuses of the University of Colorado. This year, of course, we've moved to a virtual format and I'm very pleased to say we've got um, people logging in from uh, literally around the world uh, this year to participate. We're very pleased to have Dr. Tessa Shalouche as the first of our speakers this week. Um, Tessa is an old friend um, and the co-director of the Maimonides Institute for Medicine, Ethics and the Holocaust. She also is co-chair of the Department of Bioethics and the Holocaust of the UNESCO Chair of Bioethics at Haifa. She's the co-editor of a remarkable casebook on bioethics and the Holocaust. And she and I co-edited um, the January issue of the AMA Journal of Ethics, which was a special issue on the legacy of the Holocaust um, among health professionals and for healthcare. She's also taught an undergraduate course on medicine and the Holocaust at the Technion uh, Faculty of Medicine in Israel for 15 years. And a few years ago, when we were getting our program started, she visited Colorado and was a keynote uh, live with us. And um, I have to say, we asked her to do one talk that was different from the others and that took place in Boulder in the evening. And um, it was really extraordinary. It was um, a talk that has hung with me ever since. Um, and it was to a relatively small audience um, of local community members just in Boulder. And so this year, uh, with this different format, we thought this was a terrific opportunity to um, virtually bring Tessa back to Colorado um, to give this talk to a, to a considerably larger audience. So Tessa, uh, welcome back. And uh, we're so pleased to have you. You want me to start? Yes, please. <laughs> OK, I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to talk about good evening, everybody, and thank you, Matt, for inviting me, even if virtually. Um, I'm going to talk about something different. We have Holocaust Remembrance Day here in Israel on Thursday, and you have your week of remembrance. And this is a very special opportunity for me to talk to you, even though it's a very difficult subject to talk about. We're going to talk about doctors who were prisoners, Jewish doctors and non-Jewish doctors who were prisoners in the ghettos and in the camps and who had to work in their profession as medical people with the people around them and who were sometimes patients as well in the hospitals and uh, in the various places that they were imprisoned in. Courage, complicity and compromise. Think of these three, three words while I'm talking and um, I think you'll understand what I'm saying. I'm going to take one of the doctors, her name is Lucy Adelsberger, and with her story, I'm going to tell you the stories of other doctors who were, as I said, forced to work as medical people, to do the job that they knew how to do, but the circumstances had changed, of course, dramatically. Dr. Lucy Adelsberger was a German physician, a Jewish German physician, who, of course, at some stage in 1940 was of not allowed any longer to treat German patients. As you can see, this is a prescription written in her handwriting. On the prescription, it has a, uh, the sign that she was Jewish, saying that she cannot treat, treat in, it says in the German, not, not allowed to treat other uh, patients, uh, to treat uh, Aryan patients. And she had to add the name Sarah to her name because she was Jewish, as many other Jews, of course, had to, but the doctors had to too. And this is a prescription that she gave to somebody in 1940 in Berlin. She was a very well-known immunologist. She had hopes of furthering her careers, but the hopes were dashed with the rise of national socialism, where she was forced uh, with her family into a ghetto kind of if there wasn't a real ghetto in Berlin, but she was forced into an area where there were only Jews and then arrested by the Gestapo and sent to Auschwitz. And using her story and the story of other doctors, I'm going to go through this uh, tonight. 
These people were not only prisoners, but they were physicians. And in places created for the purpose of death, they basically had to work to try and save lives. There are memoirs written, of, written after the war for those who survived, of course, demonstrate to us how they considered themselves first and foremost physicians. Their profession was essential to their survival and to their uh, work where they, were, uh, where they were situated. Even the titles of their books in many, many cases con contain the word doctor. This is Dr. Lucy Adelsberger, and this is her book, as she calls it, Auschwitz, A Doctor's Story. And many of them mention, or their titles contain the word doctor. A Nazi ghetto, or a ghetto in the Eastern Europe, was a very difficult place to practice medicine. There were very, very, uh, some of the ghettos had hospitals inside of them, and some of them had buildings where there were improvised hospitals. And of course, there was, uh, they were overcrowded, there was no medicine, there were little electricity, no heating, very, very terrible sanitary conditions. And in many ways, the hospitals were microcosmoses of the ghettos themselves. But they were, they were patients. There were many people who were ill and they had to be treated. The ghetto hospital was a place of danger. It wasn't a safe place as we consider a hospital to be. It was a place where there were consistent threats between life and death. In fact, one of the reasons that the Nazis or the Germans used to even create the ghettos were infectious diseases. They wanted to contain the Jews in areas where they would not infect uh, other populations. And so they actually formed the ghettos with one of the reasons being the, uh, um, the containment of the infectious diseases. As you can see here in the slides, uh, the slide says, you know, it's a Jewish area. There are, you can't go past the side because there are people who are uh, infectious on the other side. And on the right, you can see a poster where the, the Germans had a pathological fa uh, fear of infectious diseases. And they actually, uh, this is a propaganda post poster, but they actually believed that the Jews were carriers of these diseases. One of the doctors in uh, the lodge ghetto was Dr. Edward Reicher, who had to treat people with typhus and he, report, he had to report every day the cases of the disease. And he says, I didn't find it easy because the sick would be forcibly taken from their families. They would take sick people out of the, their homes or out of the hospitals and force them to be isolated. Parents refused, refused to give up their children. People feared that they would never see their brothers, sisters, or parents again. The building where the cases of typhus were confirmed were quarantined. No one could leave the house. And his job was to report these patients. So he had to just make the difficult decision of how to do his job. And he did report the patients. He said he had to do his job. His life, of course, would be in danger if he didn't do his job. Those were in the homes where he treated the people. In the hospitals, it was even more dangerous. People would be, uh, in some cases, people would be burnt. Patients with typhus and other infectious diseases, they would burn down whole wards together with the staff. And so one of the ways to try and come to try and fight this was to lie, to steal, to falsify medical records. Dr. Mark Borzetsky was in the Vilna ghetto and he describes how they had separate patient cards, one on the bed with a false diagnosis and one in the other room with a true diagnosis. And he says every patient had two patient cards, one on the bed with a false diagnosis and a second card was hidden in an office. The falsified cards had to be altered on a regular basis so as to coordinate the lies written on paper with the truth about the patient in case the German doctor came. If the German doctors came and discovered infectious diseases, as I said, those people and their doctors were in danger. So they had to compromise their ethical values. They had to lie, they had to steal, and they had to falsify medical records. This is Dr. Mark Dvodlitsky giving test his testimony on this at the trial of Eichmann in Jerusalem in 1963. In some of the ghettos, the Germans realized that the Jewish woman was, uh, she held the power to have more Jewish children. And this was one of their weapons that they used. They banned births. In other words, they forced abortions. And who had to perform these abortions? The Jewish doctors. So they had previously, they had, uh, of course, not perform these operations, and these were healthy women with healthy children, but this was a decree that they had to abide by in order to save the lives of these women. 
Dr. Alex Peretz, who was a gynecologist in the Kovna ghetto, writes in his memoirs in Hebrew, this is a translation, he says, because I was officially the obstetrician on the hospital, I had to see to it that these births were kept secret. I was forced to conclude that in the ghetto, there was no way out except to abort these pregnant women. Before all this, an abortion was permitted only when the women's health was in danger. But now, neither TB or any other serious disease were the reasons for people performing these abortions, rather the Gestapo and their annihilations policies. They had to perform abortions on women in order to save their lives. Of course, in the ghetto, there was a constant shortage of everything. And for the physicians, there was a constant shortage of supplies and medicines. And the, the dilemmas were who to treat and who was going to be, uh, who was, who, how, how to decide who to treat and who is to decide and how to live with the decisions that they made. An amazing story occurred in the Vilna ghetto. Dr. Abram Wainro was a very, very, he was 27 years old at the time, a physician, and the insulin was running out for the diabetic patients. So they had to decide what they were going to do with the diabetic patients who needed the insulin. And he forms, an, um, he does an amazing thing. At 27 years old, in these conditions in the ghetto, he forms an ethical committee. Three doctors, a rabbi, and a lawyer. And they have to decide on how they're going to distribute the little supply of insulin that they have. The first was to, to speak was the rabbi. He said that God alone can decide when to give life and when not to and when to take it away, and he's not taking part of it. Two of the doctors stood up and walked away. The third could not decide either. And the lawyer started to justify the selection from a legal point of view. They basically dispersed and they didn't come to a decision. In his memoirs, he writes that in comparison with the enormous numbers killed in the ghettos and in the camps after the liquidation of the ghettos, the battle for the justice of the insulin seems unimportant, perhaps even ridiculous, were it not so tragic. However, this battle essentially highlighted the principal problem. How were they going to decide who was going to get the little supply, the meager supply that they had? They had to make these decisions. Another aspect he, he addresses in his memoirs is who is permitted to intervene? When must one intervene and when it is forbidden to intervene? This is a photograph of him when he was uh, sent to work camps from the ghetto, from the Vilna ghetto. And this is a photograph of him with four other uh, physicians on release. Hunger. Hunger was omnipresent in the ghetto. There was um, not enough food to go around for the, for the people. And basically one of the, you could actually relate to it that everybody was ill in the ghetto from hunger, from hunger and its relative conditions. It was a major problem in all the ghettos, of course, and of course in the camps. At its peak, Warsaw Ghetto had about half a million people in the ghetto, in a tiny place. Courage, complicity and compromise. Dr. Israel Milkovsky was the head of the public health department in the Warsaw Ghetto. He was also a member of the Jewish Council and he initiated an incredible study called the Hunger Study, where they decided the physicians, very experienced uh, physicians, 28 physicians, decided to study the very disease that their, their patients were suffering and that they themselves were suffering from. And they organized these physicians um, to conduct a strict scientific uh, study, mainly an observational study, but not only an observational study about the physiological uh, changes that occur in the body in hunger. They used, they studied children and they studied adults. Uh, this is a list of the doctors who participated in the study, the 28 of them. As you can see, almost all of them were sent to Treblinka and found and were murdered in Treblinka. And this is a publication of the hunger study that was smuggled out of the ghetto, hidden for years, and after the war, by the Polish or by Polish physicians was published in Polish and in about 1979 was translated by Myron Winnick into English. It's an amazing study. It's a clinical study, as I said, on children. These are images from the original uh, pub, uh, work published in Polish. These are findings, as you can see, scientific studies of what happens to the body uh, under hunger. The ethics of the study. Myron Winnick, the, edit, the editor of the uh, English 
version says that they were not investigators who came and did their tests and went home. These were physicians dealing with the easiest disease to cure, starvation, and helpless to affect that cure. They cared for their patients in whatever manner they had available and at the same time noted their deterioration. Afflicted with the same disease, knowing that their time was limited, they persevered. One of the Polish, a new study on, on the studies has, she studied the study and she looks at it from a different angle and, and you can actually see the, the uh, many cases where there, there were, um, it was not only an observational study, they were given drugs and injected and blood was taken from these patients. And of course, there's an ethical debate about the study as well. And she writes that these patients were subject to various procedures, some of which were aimed at a correct assessment of their medical condition. Most of them, however, she writes, bore attributes of medical experimentation aimed at examining the specific characteristics of hunger disease. But the doctors who performed the study mainly did it with the aim of reporting to the world and keeping these keeping the reports and, and hopefully they, they all hoped it would be published afterwards to show the world what was happening in Warsaw, how, these, how the whole, all our population was basically starving. Dr. Adina Blady Schwager was a, was a pediatrician and she took place, she took part in the hunger study. She worked in the hospital uh, called Burson Bauman Children's Hospital, which you can see in the, in the um, picture here. As I said, she also took place in the study. And these are her words on the study. She says, doctors in the ghetto not only continue to be doctors, but up to the very last moment, kept up scientific research for those who were to follow. They really wanted to leave a record and they succeeded. The study, is, uh, the study lasted only a few months. Uh, all the patients and almost all the doctors uh, did not survive. As I said, they were sent on the transports to Treblinka. Transports. People were in consistent, constant danger of being transported to the East, as I said, and the doctors were involved in decisions. Who was going to be transported? The Nazi Gestapo rule in most of the ghettos forced the physicians to decide who was going to be selected to be deported to work in the labor camps and who was going to also be uh, deported to the concentration camps. Mordechai Lenski was a doctor in, the, uh, in one of the ghettos who also had to, he tells about this terrible dilemma of her having to choose patients uh, to be deported, knowing that the conditions that they were going to were probably going to be even worse than what they had been in the, uh, in the ghetto. Children were abandoned after their parents had been deported, after their parents had been transported out of the ghetto, and there were many, many abandoned children in all of the ghettos. Our Adina Blady Schwager, who I, who I, who I'd mentioned before, was this pediatrician. She was, a, she was working with, with small children, and she realized, they got the news that the next day, the, the, the whole hospital, including her patients and herself, would be sent to, would be transported. There was going to be an, what they call an action the next day. And she promised her patients that she would look after them, these small children. She promised them that she would be there with them. And she realized that she could not keep her promise. And she makes an extremely difficult choice. In her words, I took the morphine upstairs and just as during those, real, those years of real work in the hospital, I had bent down over the little bed. So now I poured this last medicine into their tiny mouths. And downstairs there was already screaming because the Germans were taking the sick from the wards to the cattle trucks. After that, we went into the older children, she says, and told them that this medicine was going to make their pain disappear. They believed us and they drank the required amount. And then I told them to get into their beds and to go to sleep. I don't remember what happened after that. She escaped from the ghetto. She joined the resistance in Warsaw ghetto and she survived. She, she lamented over these decisions and she only wrote her memoirs as a very old lady. She couldn't write this her whole life. Another dilemma that the doctors had, they could leave their patients. Many of them were in positions where they could have actually escaped from the ghetto. They could have left. The lady in the picture was the head of the Burson Bauman Hospital that I showed for previously. 
And she decided that she, ref she was going to refuse to leave her small patients, even when she had the chance. Her friends offered her a way out, her Polish friends, and she refused. She remained in the ghetto and she probably, nobody knows uh, her, the exact details, but she probably died during the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. She refused to leave her small patients. Another very famous doctor who many of you have probably heard of is Dr. Janusz Korczak. He was a pediatrician and a writer and an educator. He too refused to leave his patients, his small children, his orphans. He cared for them in orphanages. And he went together with 200 orphans in his care on the train to Treblinka in 1942. Marek Balin was a medical student at the time and he was working in the hospital with Dr. Blady Schwager and with Korczak and he writes, and who had to condemn them to this horrible inhumane death? Not only Jews versus Jews, but physicians against patients under their care patients whose lives they had tried to prolong to soothe their suffering, save their limbs and cure their minds. They had to make these choices for the Germans. When they reached the camps, the doctors, of course, um, in some cases, were also uh, found themselves in positions where they had to work. In the first years of the camps, doctors were not allowed to work at all. The main aim of the camps was, of course, not life, but death. But uh, from about 1942-43, they realized the Germans that they had a, they were losing people who could work in their labor factories. And so they let the prisoner doctors care for the prisoners uh, in the camps in very basic places that they called hospitals or medical, um, medical sheds, but, but they made them, they, they let them care for them. This doctor in the patient is a non-Jewish uh, doctor, an Austrian doctor, who was sent, to, was arrested by the Gestapo and sent to Auschwitz because she hid Jewish friends together with her physician husband. One day she asked the Nazi doctor who she was working with in the camp in Auschwitz, how he could justify his atrocious actions with the Hippocratic oath that he had sworn. And his reply to her was, of course I'm a doctor and I want to preserve life. Out of respect for human life, I would remove a purulent appendix from a diseased body. The Jews are the diseased appendix in the body of mankind. That was his version, his view of Hippocrates. Dr. Ella Lingles Reiner received the Righteous Among the Nations Award from Yad Vashem in 1980. Going back to our Dr. Lucy Adelsberger, she too was sent to Auschwitz eventually, and she was sent to work in, with a, in a camp that was called the Gypsy Camp where uh, people of Gypsy origin were um, imprisoned. And there was a tremendous typhus epidemic then. She was sent there to work with the Gypsy uh, prisoners. And she says, here we were in a small block, 50 feet long and 30 feet wide, where nearly 1,000 prisoners were packed together, where water was a costly rarity, where everything was swarming with lice. The only thing the doctors could do for their patients, emaciated, skeletal or swollen with the edema of starvation and wallowing in feverish deliriums as they were, was to comfort and to encourage them. The medical work in the extermination camps was completely devoid of sense due to the repeated selections by the Nazi doctor. The infamous selections are well known of the doctor standing on the ramp as the, as the trains arrived at Auschwitz, selecting people right or left, life or death, but they used to do these selections in medical blocks as well. This is an illustration of one of the books published by the Auschwitz Memorial about how the doctors used to select people from the medical barracks themselves, from the hospital barracks themselves, people who were too ill to work. And so there was a constant threat of selections uh, um, over, these, over the, all the people, but of course over the doctors as well. Dr. Adelsberger explains to us that the problems for them in Auschwitz, she says, was not weather selection, but when and how. Not only did we physically live in the shadow of the chimneys, but mentally as well. They were caring for patients in these hospital blocks at the same time, knowing that any minute a Nazi SS doctor could walk in and select patients to be sent, of course, uh, to the gas. Another doctor, a Czech doctor, Dr. Albert Haas, who afterwards survived and formed the first. Um, Lung department at the new at the NYU in New York. 
He was a doctor in Auschwitz, a young doctor. This is a photograph of him probably at Auschwitz, uh, given to me by his son. And he says he refused to play a role in the selection of the inmates in the medical block. He says, soon I realized that I could be somewhat more active in my fight to save lives or at least delay death. And he used to send the people out of the hospital, even though they were critically ill, in order to prevent them, in order to uh, not make them um, part of the selections by the Nazi doctors. And then he, after the selection passed, after the doctor had visited the ward, he would readmit them. Insoluble moral dilemmas. He says, no one could be a saint in the daily and often primitive fight for survival. But for me, those times when the basic values of my profession, which I still cherish deeply, wrenchingly contradicted my instinctive responses to the need of survival, the insoluble moral dilemmas that I faced tore me deeply. Even today, he wrote his book, his daughter-in-law wrote it with him in 1984. He says, even today, I still question decisions that I made during those years. Crossing the line, Dr. Ellie Cohen was in a block at some stage where he found himself with 600 other patients. And one of the patients um, ran away. He escaped during the night and the SS doctor threatened Cohen and the other physicians who were prisoners there and caring for these patients, that if they didn't control the situation, all 600 of them would be sent to the gas. And so he makes a, another impossible decision together with a colleague to actually kill the patient who, was, who had escaped and who was actually um, behaving. He was probably a mental patient or he was just hysterical, whatever, but he, they decided to murder him. And it wasn't, an, it wasn't a one-off incident. They did this again in order to save the 600 other people in the ward. And he says, yes, I infringed the ethical rule that one is a doctor not to murder people, but to try and keep them alive, to try and cure them and help them. But this was one of the decisions that they made. We talked about pregnancy in the ghettos, well, pregnancy in the camps too. If a woman was found pregnant, it automatically condemned that lady to death. If the SS um, doctors found pregnant women they sent them automatically to the death. But there were cases where people uh, were, su survived the selections and basically went into the camps pregnant. And the doctors were faced with the, with the decisions of how to treat these pregnant women. Dr. Adelsberger had to make these decisions. She worked with pregnant women. And she explains to us that according to SS guidelines, every Jewish child condemned his mother to death. And of course, medical ethics prescribe that if during labor, the mother and child are in danger, priority must be given to save the life of the mother. And she says, we prisoner physicians quietly acted in accordance with this regulation. The child had to die so that the life of the mother might be saved. Dr. Gisela Pearl had the same quandary, had the same, had to make also these difficult decisions of destroying life, these babies, so that the mother would be saved. And she says, no one will ever know what it meant to me to destroy these babies. After years of medical practice, she later survived. She went to the States. She was a gynecologist in New York for many years. She came as an elderly lady to Israel where her family was, and she died in uh, Jerusalem. Uh, she says, after years of medical practice, childbirth was still to me the most beautiful miracle of nature. I love these newborn not as a doctor, but as a mother. And it was again and again my own child whom I killed to save the life of the woman. That is Dr. Gisela Pearl. There is a film made of Dr. Gisela Pearl called Out of the Ashes as well. Some pregnant women were experimented on because they were pregnant. The lady on the right, Ruth Elias, the younger woman, is standing next to an older lady who was a doctor, Dr. Masse Steinberg. Ruth was sent, she was 17 years old. She came from Theresienstadt. She arrived in Auschwitz pregnant. And she was chosen by Mengele to be experimented on. He took her and another woman and some other young women who were pregnant and he gave them relatively good conditions and he let them have their children in Auschwitz. She had a baby in Auschwitz, but after she was, she had the baby. The experiment was, he made he forced her to tie to 
to uh, bind her breasts and not to feed the baby, telling her that he wanted to experiment to see how long a newborn baby could live without being fed. And for days she agonized next to her child who was dying, of course, without, um, without, without, be, uh, without being allowed to feed him. And one day, um, this Dr. Marcia Steinberg, who herself was a prisoner in Auschwitz, comes to Ruth and says to Ruth, uh, Ruth, uh, you have to do something about this. She says to her, I've sworn the Hippocratic Oath. It's my duty to save human life, your life. I must not kill. You must do it safe to save your own life. Quickly do it now. And she gives Ruth a syringe with an injection of morphine and Ruth herself murders her own dying baby. Dr. Ruth survived Auschwitz and came to live in Israel. And many years later, she befriended Dr. Marcel Steinberg, who too survived and was alone in Israel without any family. And Ruth basically took care of this doctor who she regarded as her angel of life for the rest of her life in Israel. Prisoner doctors were also involved in other experiments. I think many of you have heard of the story of Exodus written by Leon Uris and the film made of Exodus, of course. In Exodus, Leon Uris writes that this doctor on the right, a Polish prisoner doctor, performed experiments where he says here in block SL, in block 10, Dr. Um, Wirtz used women as guinea pigs and Dr. Schumann sterilized by castration and Klauberg removed ovaries and Deering performed 17,000 experiments. Well, Deering sued Leon Uris for libel. Why? He didn't, um, he, afterwards he was in London and he didn't ever admit that he, he didn't, that he had done something wrong. What he did say was that he had performed these experiments, these operations, but not in those numbers, many, much less numbers. And he sued Leon Uris for libel. In 1964, there was a trial in London. In 1962, there was a trial in London where, as I said, Deering sues Leon Uris for libel. And the trial eventually became a trial about the experiments that were performed in Block 10, the infamous experimental block in London. And at the trial were three prisoner doctors. I've mentioned, uh, no, I haven't mentioned them before. Two of them were Jewish and one of them was Polish. Dr. Loeta Olowska on the left, Adelaide it was a Jewish Polish doctor, uh, daughter, uh, Adelaide Hautwell was on, uh, on the right, a non-Jewish French doctor sent because she was part of the resistance. She worked in Block 10. And in the middle, Alina Bruder, who was a Jewish doctor, who too was forced to work in Block 10 with the experimental victims. And they basically gave their testimony at the trial, testifying that it was possible to refuse to comply with the Nazi doctors. It was possible to refuse to perform these operations. Kleinova says that it was possible to refuse, it was possible while not so, saying so explicitly, and it was possible to execute the orders, and finally it was possible to execute them with a great deal of zeal. In other words, she's, she gave testimony that these doctors had a choice. Dr. Hartfeld, the French doctor who I mentioned, she said, about all the decisions that they had to make while in Auschwitz. She said that we were in, in situations where we had to make abnormal decisions. This is the, this, the, the photograph that I have here of the armband that she had to wear in Auschwitz saying that she was a friend of the Jews. That is what is, it says there in French. She had to wear this sign say, you know, telling everybody that she wasn't Jewish, but she was a traitor in that she was a friend of the Jews. She was sent to Auschwitz, as I say, because she was part of the French resistance. And the third doctor who I mentioned also stood up to the, to the Nazi doctors and, refer, and refused to take part in the experiments. And she said, always in the format of my mind, I've kept my Hippocratic oath, that I would be shot or sent to the gas chamber, of course, was possible. Another ambiguous case. Dr. Miklos Nisli was a Jewish pathologist chosen by Mengele because he was a pathologist to perform autopsies on experimented victims. He was also chosen, he had to, as part of his job, care for the 
Sunder Commander personnel, who were the personnel who worked in the gas chambers, who actually in the crematoriums, who uh, who who fueled and who actually worked there uh, in the crematoriums. And he had to care for these people and at the same time perform autopsies on experimented victims for the infamous Dr. Mengele. Uh, he performed these autopsies, and that is why in an article written by a recent historian, he calls him the ambiguous victim because he did his job professionally, that he made his choice to do his job. But he, of course, uh, he had family alive in Auschwitz at the time, and he was certain that this would allow them to live if he would, if he, if he would do this work for Mengele. And in his, in his memoirs, he writes, once again, showing us how important his job was, how important he, his life was as a doctor. He writes that I write this work, which he wrote very early on. He wrote it in 1946, his memoirs uh, today, which are part of a very, very important source of the experiments that were performed uh, in the camps. He says, when I lived through these horrors, which were below, beyond all imagining, I was not a writer, but a doctor. Today, in telling them, I write not as a reporter, but as a doctor. He did perform the uh, autopsies for Mengele. Of course, he didn't perform experiments, but he did do his job. He didn't refuse. Complicity, collaboration, compromise. This is not a judgment call. I'm just telling you the stories. Um, of course, nobody can judge these people. It's just to show how complex these places were, especially if you were a doctor. Maximilian Samuel was a very esteemed uh, elderly man, man when he was sent to Auschwitz. In the picture, he is receiving a, a, an award from a medal in the army for the First World War as a soldier in the, um, uh, in the Polish army. And here in the a, a picture on the, on the uh, in recent, in later years, him as an elderly man. He was sent to, um, to Auschwitz where he also had, he was a gynecologist. He, he was forced to perform operations in block 10 for the Nazi doctors. And he has been labeled by some of the historians as a Jewish medical collaborator, but he too had a wife and daughter alive in Auschwitz at the time. He was allowed to visit them uh, at some stages, but uh, after some time, he was too sent to the gas, probably because he had discovered so many secrets of what was taking part uh, with these experiments. But there are also testimonies on the other side. And the, the lady and man in picture is a lady who he experimented on, a Jewish woman who came afterwards to Israel and survived, and she went back to visit. This is a picture of her in Block 10 at Auschwitz with her son. And he told her, Samuel, this doctor told her while he was operating on her, Aliza, it will be okay, don't worry, I will see to it that one day you will be able to have uh, children. And he pretended to actually remove her ovaries when he should have been um, doing the operation, uh, in removing her ovaries for the uh, uh, SS doctor who he was working for. And so he sabotaged her operation and other operations for other women who he helped in this, in this way. Choice or complicity or collaboration or compromise. I don't know what the answer is. There are, there are very few examples of prisoner doctors, but there are examples of collaboration. And the person in the picture is a Jewish doctor who actually renounced his Judaism. And, um, uh, but of course it didn't help him. He was still sent to the camps because he was Jewish. He ended up in Buchenwald camp. His story is very complex, uh, but he did perform cruel experiments and he was tried. He was sent, he was put on trial and he was sentenced to, uh, life to life imprisonment in 1947. Another physician who was a prisoner at Auschwitz, of course, he, was, he became afterwards a very renowned psychiatrist. He talks in his memoirs about cho choice. He talks about the last freedom, the freedom of choice of one's own attitude cannot be taken away from a person. And in retaining these values, man may retain his human dignity even in a concentration camp. This is something, of course, that I think only a prisoner or only a survivor could talk about. But Dr. Viktor Frankl believed that they did have a choice. 
the man in the doctor in the picture is Dr. Leo Ettingill. This is the picture of him on, on liberation from Buchenwald in 1945 with other prisoners. And on the right, of course, as an elderly man, he was a Czech doctor. He escaped from Czechoslovakia to Norway, but he was uh, transported to Auschwitz with about the other 900 Norwegian Jews who were sent to the camps and he survived. He worked as a doctor in Auschwitz and one day a young boy was sent to him who had a terrible leg infection. And if you had an infection of your leg and you couldn't work, it basically it was a death sentence in Auschwitz. And he knew that he had to do everything to save this young man. And he was not a surgeon, but he promised the boy that he would stay with him and he would organize for help to be given to him to save his life so that he could uh, so that he could work. He had nothing to offer these, the young boy except his words of comfort, and yet this was the savior of his young patient. More than a dozen years later, his, doc, his patient, who was Eddie Weasel, the renowned um, Nobel Prize winner, and of course survivor of the camps, wrote about this doctor. He's the young boy that Leo Ettinger saved was Eddie Weasel. And he writes about his doctor years later in his book called Night, which he wrote in 1960. He wrote, the doctor, a great Jewish doctor, a prisoner like ourselves was quite definite. I must have an operation. If we waited the toes and perhaps the whole leg would have been amputated. The doctor came to me to tell me that the operation would be the very next day. He said to me, don't be afraid. Everything will be all right. My doctor, Dr. Ettinger was there. There was balm in every word he spoke and every glance he gave he held a message of hope, and he did save Ellie's life. Ellie Weasel, the same Ellie Weasel, wrote in the New England Journal of Medicine, in our New England Journal of Medicine in, 19, in 2005, he wrote about medicine during the Nazi period and medicine during the Holocaust. And the words of Ellie Weasel are, now we know, during the period of the past century that I call night, medicine was practiced in certain places not to heal, but to harm, not to fight off death, but to serve it. In the conflict between good and evil during the Second World War, the infamous Nazi doctors played a crucial role. They preceded the torturers and assassins in the science of organized cruelty that we call the Holocaust. Yet inside the concentration camps, among the prisoners, medicine remained a noble profession. More or less everywhere, Eddie Wiesel writes, Doctors without instruments or medications tried desperately to relieve the suffering and misfortune of their fellow prisoners, sometimes at the price of their own health or their own lives. I knew such several doctors. For them, each human being represented not an abstract idea, but a universe with its secrets, its treasures, its sources of anguish, and its poor possibilities for victory, however fleeting over death and its disciple. In an inhumane universe, they had remained humane. And to end my talk, I go back to Dr. Lucy Adelsberger, who writes right at the beginning of her book, which I say, as I said, she wrote as a very old lady, almost on her deathbed in 1996. This report, she writes, tells the story of the victims, not with a purpose of opening old wounds, but of passing it on as a legacy for Jews and for all mankind. It will fulfill its purpose only if it helps teach us, who call ourselves the children of God, to become better human beings, to truly love our neighbors, and to work towards the eradication of brutality from the face of the earth. And I think that puts it really well, the legacy of these doctors who found themselves in impossible positions, who had to perf who performed their use the, what they knew what they knew how to do their professions they were physicians to try and help the people around them who were basically their patients to try and help them they didn't always succeed and they had very very difficult choices to make but I think it's important for their legacy to to remain on and for us to remember these uh, these survivors as physicians but as Lucy Asdelsberger says it's important for all mankind. And I think I thank you for for listening to this difficult talk, and I'll be um, happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you um, so much, uh, Dr. Tessa Shalouche. Um,
I, I imagine um, if you were here when we first got started, I said that this is a talk that has just stuck with me um, for the last several years and we really felt it deserved a, a larger audience. Um, I'll also say, by the way, we had uh, a smaller audience when I made those opening comments. Um, we've had a uh, hundred more people join us since we started. And to, as far as I can tell, no one has dropped off. Um, so that's quite, uh, it's a, it's a quite uh, amazing set of stories. Um, I also, uh, before I move to questions, want to remember, because I forgot at the beginning, to thank the sponsors of this program, uh, the Rose Community Foundation and Jewish Colorado are both silver sponsors for the Holocaust Genocide and Contemporary Bioethics Program, which is uh, housed, of course, and supported by the William S. Silvers Foundation um, at our CU uh, Center for Bioethics and Humanities. And this program is supported by um, a, a large number of donors, uh, big and small, to the program. It really relies on donations from the communities we serve across Colorado and more recently around the world. And so I really want to thank the, the people who made this presentation and the other presentations this week possible. Um, let me go to the uh, question and answer. And um, I, I'm going to start with what I think is a pretty difficult one around um, triage, because uh, you started off with a couple of stories that are just incredibly compelling um, about situations where, uh, where physicians, in the end, had to make life or death choices. And uh, I know, you know, at one point, someone sort of referred back to it and said these were almost insignificant because so few people were affected, considering how the, the scale of the eventual Holocaust itself. Um, but those decisions are decisions very similar to the ones we've been wrestling with over the last year with uh, shortages of ventilators and shortages of oxygen and shortages of staff and of personal protective equipment. Um, and one of the things that comes up over and over again with those conversations is, should those types of decisions be made uh, by a committee rather than having them be put to uh, the individual doctor standing at the bedside. And the arguments around that issue have in some ways reflected the arguments that you uh, talked to us about and that sometimes arise around the Holocaust itself that committee decision-making feels very impersonal, um, but committee decision-making also allows the doctor at the bedside to continue to serve as a doctor and not um, forcing that doc, right? So the, the doctor you talked about um, in the end was left to, to himself. He tried to create a committee and the committee uh, uh, didn't want to make the decision. Um, and I'm wondering if you have any reflections about how that history, you know, has or has not played out again in, in the last year with the shortages we've seen around uh, the COVID pandemic. Well, of course it's played out. I think also, I don't think we can look at it in the biggest scale. I think these are stories that we have to um, react or, or, or think about on, on a personal level. You know, of course, as even he, they themselves said, this might have seemed completely unimportant decisions when thousands or hundreds of thousands of people were being murdered and transported. What, how significant was it that one doctor had to choose between giving people who had diabetes how much insulin he had? But these people, first of all, they were working, this was their lives, this was their daily lives. If you have to think about people in these in impossible situations making these decisions as physicians as they were was part of their part of their work. They did not take this as you say, you know, in retrospect you can talk about it on a bigger scale, but this was their lives. Um, it was it was the decisions that they had to make. He tried to form, they tried to form to make them as ethically as they could with other colleagues with ethical committees even and yet it didn't it was really really difficult to make and of course when we think about today or or medicine in general not only in the past year that we've all been through with making critical decisions about uh, allocations of resources for our patients worldwide it's been a worldwide problem mm -hmm. um, I don't think we can you know we, the 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 reason is not to take these person these very 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 extreme stories but it's just to show that in, in very difficult con context, doctors are faced with these decisions. These, this is our lives, whether, you know, whether it's um, extreme, I think we have to 
remember these physicians and these Holocaust survivors. But of course, this is part of our work and this was part of their work, which is not always recognized when we talk about Holocaust survivors. We sometimes forget the, the small stories which are important. Those are the stories that, that, those are the things we remember and that's the way we remember their legacy. So there's this kind of, it's important to remember them and to realize their stories. And of course, the, 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 the issues that are at, attached to it are relevant to today. They always will be relevant. Um, Michael Groden has submitted a question. He wants you to, and I, I hesitate to ask this because it's almost a whole nother talk, but um, would, you, would you care to share um, any comments on the medical school in the Warsaw Ghetto? Of course, I didn't include the story of the <laughs> Warsaw Ghetto Medical School because it's another talk. But um, hopefully, once again, the AMA Journal of Ethics will be coming out with a, a very short story storyboard um, session on the Jewish doctors for uh, the Holocaust Day Remo uh, 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 Memorial Day of 2021. And we, we, we tell the story there of the medical school. There was an incredible story, I'll tell it in 60 seconds, of a secret medical school in the Warsaw Ghetto. The, the, the reasons are complex for creating the school, but the fact is that there were uh, medical students who of course no longer could continue their studies. And there were medical professors who, of, who could not continue their teaching in Warsaw once the ghetto was found. And for many reasons, there was an incredible um, um, collaboration with the university in Warsaw, the, art, the, the regular university that was also secret because the Polish uh, students also had to go underground to learn medicine. But the Jews in Warsaw, the Jewish medical students to get, were able to form a medical school in Warsaw that functioned for, I think it was 15 months in secret at night, despite uh, the dangers of being found by the Gestapo. Of course, they, they used to put disinfect, they, they, they disguised the medical student, they told the Germans that they were forming courses for sanitation to improve the sanitary conditions in the ghetto and that they were going to have courses to teach these students uh, this. And so they, they approved this and they didn't come near because as I said, they were petrified of infectious diseases and um, the students literally were in danger of reaching these buildings which were uh, surrounded by the, by, by the Germans all the time. And uh, 500 students participated in the secret medical school. Unfortunately, only about 50 survived because once again, uh, the, the, the Warsaw Ghetto was liquidated and the Jews were sent to Treblinka, most of them. But uh, some of them did survive. And amazingly so, they even received credit for the studies that were taught during the 15 months of the existence of the Warsaw Medical School. It was recognized by the University of Warsaw post-war and the students, uh, the very few that did survive were able to continue their studies and of course subsequently became physicians. It was an, an amazing uh, event, amazing um, story. It's a story for a whole nother lecture, which of course uh, is possible to give if anybody wants to listen to it. It's, you can read about this uh, amazing story. Yeah, of course. Um, Tessa, Miriam Zimmerman uh, wanted, wanted to know wh why uh, not mention Hans Munch. Um, you know, he, uh, it's a complex story also, probably wor <laughs> worthy of another hour. Um, but, but do you want to say a word about Hans Munch and, um, and his sort of legacy? Well, I didn't mention Hans Munch because I talked about prisoner doctors. That was the kind of talk. As I said, we could talk on this subject, we, we you know, there are, it's a, it's a subject for hours and hours of, of reading or talking. Um, Hans Munch was an SS doctor. I'm not an expert on Hans Munch, but I mean, Hans Munch was an SS doctor who was considered basically to be more humane in some respects than, than many others that we uh, talk about. And he was also one of the few remaining doctors at Auschwitz uh, who talked, who, who, who exposed themselves, who were willing to, to say what he had done. And he actually, in his older years, there is an, a, there's a very good film made by an Israeli many, many years ago where Hans Munch actually says, 
he ex expresses remorse and regret for what he did and that he shouldn't have done what he did, which was not common among the, the Germans in general and, of course, among the, S the, the, the positions themselves. Uh, very, very few of them ever uh, showed any remorse or apologized. With Hans Munch, there's an interesting story. He went with one of the Mengele twins, with Eva Kohl. Um, he didn't perform experiments on the twins, but he was probably aware of them. And he he did. He worked in I think he worked in a laboratory kind of situation more than than uh, experimenting as per such. He also he said that he refused to take part in the selections that they wanted him to do on the ramp there, as many doctors in uh, were, were they did that job he refused and he was with Eva Eva who is an amazing it's another story and it's another talk Eva was one of the Mengele twin survivors who in her own for her own personal reasons decided she was going to forgive the Nazis for what they did to her otherwise she couldn't continue that was her way of continuing her life was to forgive not to forget Eva she spent her life remembering and making sure that others remembered, but to forgive. And she went with Hans Munch to Auschwitz and they signed as kind of a, a mutual document to he, he admitting to what they had, what had been done and she saying that she forgave them. And that's the story of Hans Munch in a nutshell, tiny, tiny story. Um, David Children writes in, uh, he wants to know whether doctors engaged in triage, like in the post-arrival evaluations um, at Auschwitz, if there's any evidence that physicians doing that evolved, so they maybe started complicit and became more defiant, or started defiant and became more complicit over time. Um, and I, I think you you spoke to at least one person who felt like they made some evolution to become a little more defiant over time. But I'm wondering if there's, uh, if there's evidence of people sort of changing their approach. It's a, I think it's a very personal thing. Um, you know, if they could, uh, from, from the many memoirs that are available, it's almost a situation of if they could, then they did. If they could try and do something, send patients away, um, so that they wouldn't be selected, then they did. The the physician patient, the physicians in in Auschwitz and other camps were uh, um, were in an impossible situation. They were caring for patients, knowing that any minute they themselves, together with their patients, could be selected for the gas. So there are cases where they tried their. Many of them in their memoirs say that they tried their best with all kinds of uh, tricks to kind of cover up. Uh, people who were too ill to work or people who were, uh, they used to, as I said, they used to send them away and then say, come back to the hospital for treatment later because it's the place of danger. Um, it's, it's a very, per everybody had a personal story. It depends where they were, how they could. The doctors in the ghettos as well had, they had to kind of do these, make these selections. And once again, there are cases of nurses in the Warsaw ghetto breaking people's legs, making people either breaking their legs or putting on pl plaster of Paris, you know, kind of bounding the legs to show to show the Gestapo that the people were too ill to be sent and, and trying to delay or postpone or, 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 or cancel altogether the transports. It's a very, very uh, difficult question, this one of triage of, of participating in the selections, but most of, but many of the physicians were faced with these choices. And as I said, there were impossible choices. The uh, Lady Schwalier decides that she's going to euthanize. You know, she's going to. She wanted to spare the children death in the camps, or or suffering, or worse suffering. It's a kind of a bad situation, bad or worse choice. Um, so uh, we we have to close. I'm so sorry because we could go on, and I really I really wanted to ask you about. The, the, the way in which denigration of persecuted groups always seems to entail using members of the persecuted group to implement the persecution, right? So the, the famous example is the capos in the camps, but slave owners did this as well, right? They would pick out one slave and have that person be in charge of 
lashing or you know other types of punishments. And and I think what you've shown us today is that um, that doctors uh, ended up in some instances becoming the tools of persecution, even as they were the persecuted group themselves. And I have to assume that there's some kind of explicit strategy for subjugation that involves using members of the group against, uh, against their own uh, people, if you will. Um, tomorrow's program uh, and Wednesday's program will be uh, different speakers. They will be uh, similar in terms of their two themes around courage, complicity, and compromise. The speakers tomorrow and on Wednesday will be uh, Rebecca Carter Chand, who is with the US Holocaust Memorial Museum, and Susanna Serkin, who is with Physicians for Human Rights. They'll speak about the history of complicity, compromise, uh, and courage during the Holocaust and how that legacy informs uh, decision-making today uh, for medical and other professionals who have to choose whether to speak up or remain silent in the line of uh, their duty. I also, um, before we close, wanna say save the date for next year. Um, we are very excited. Next year's program will take place from April 25th to 29th. The focus will be on the legacy of the Holocaust and health equity and structural racism today. Um, and I am very pleased to announce because I think no one but a few of, of the people on the call know this. Uh, we just confirmed on Friday that one of our keynote speakers next year will be Dr. Aletha Maybank, who is the first ever Chief Health Equity Officer for the American Medical Association. So with that, thank you all for joining us today. And I hope we get to see many of you again uh, at other parts of the program throughout this week of remembrance. Thank you all. Thank you, Matt.